Well, Matthew chapter 7, I want to speak about this morning how Jesus teaches on a mountain. You know, there are good teachers and bad teachers, but all teachers want to accomplish something. But sometimes it just doesn't quite come across like, it do, like you want it to come across. I read this account that uh, one of the first grade students asked, how do you spell toad? Well, the teacher replied, uh, we just read a story about a toad and I helped him spell it out, T-O-A-D. Satisfied, the young boy finished writing the story he had begun, then read it out loud. I towed my mama, I wanted a dog for my birthday. <laughs> or some of the elementary teachers, maybe like my wife, you have carpet time. Carpet time. Where the kids can come read and, and my wife has these spots and, and we saw this. What the teacher said is, please choose a smart seat where you will make good choices. What the first graders heard the WWF is holding tryouts today on our carpet. Well, the student who asked the teacher, I don't understand why my grade was so low on my research paper. How did I do? The teacher's response, the English teacher's response, actually, you didn't turn in a research paper. You turned in a random, a random assemblage of sentences. In fact, the sentence, sentences were apparently kidnapped in the dead of night against their will into this violent, arbitrarily plan of yours, clearly placed on the pages with no apparent thought. Reading your paper was like watching an unfamiliar, uncomfortable people at a party that no one wanted to be at the first place. See, you didn't submit a research paper. You submitted a hostage situation. <laughs> oh, then this one. Teacher said, I recently ran an old student of mine. The student said, I always liked you. You never had any favorites. You were mean to everyone. <laughs> it's not right. Walking through the, the hallways at a middle school, I saw the new substitute teacher standing outside his classroom with his forehead against a locker, and I heard him mutter, how did you get yourself into this? Knowing he was assigned to a difficult class, I, I tried to offer moral support. Are you okay? I asked. Can I help? He lifted his head and replied, I'll be fine as soon as I get this kid out of the locker. <laughs> Teaching. A wonderful, hard, filled with reward, sometimes with stress. As we come to Matthew chapter 7, we see an account of Jesus in the end of this particular section of Scripture, often it's referred to as Jesus' sermon on the mount, on a mountain. It's, it's getting warmer outside, and when it gets warmer, I almost always have this question during our school day here. They say, Pastor Howell, can we go outside and learn under the pavilion? Our pavilion's out those doors to the left, right off the parking lot. Yeah, of course, why would you not want to learn in the pavilion? What could possibly go wrong in the pavilion? What could be distracting in the pavilion? Of course, there'll never be a police car that passes on the road. There won't be anyone that comes by, no semi-trucks. There won't be any birds that catch your attentions. You have enough time, enough trouble paying attention in class. There's no way we're going out to the pavilion. And yet Jesus taught on a mountain. At the end of this, and that takes us to Matthew chapter 7, at the end, in verse number 28, the scripture tells us this, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, when he got all done, when the lesson was done, when, 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 the, when the time he was teaching was finished in this section, when it was all done, the people were astonished at his doctrine. They were astonished. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I believe Jesus, as the Son of God, was a masterful teacher. He knew how to, how, to, how to word things correctly and how to impart truth in a very specific way. And this morning, very briefly, I want to look at three characteristics uh, as Jesus taught that I think will be help, helpful to all of us. Because the fact is, while some of us have a particular calling as a teacher, we are all called to teach. We're all called with an area of influence, and sometimes it'll be in a classroom, sometimes it'll be in a church setting, sometimes it'll be in a job, and you help train someone else, you have to teach them how to do their job. Sometimes it's in a household, I have three children, and if you don't think you have to teach three children, then you've never had children before. I remember one time early on, when my oldest son, who's now 10, was very young, and I had his hand in mine, his hand was in mine, and I said, Johnny, let's skip. 
And he looked up at me with those, with those big eyes and he said, Daddy, what's skip? Have you ever tried to explain skip? Well, you know, you kind of put one leg and, and this leg and you kind of go faster than walking but slower than running and you kind of hop off one foot to the other foot. And, and you know what, Johnny, let me just show you what it is. That would be a whole lot easier. Have you ever watched a young boy try to skip for the first time? Could make millions off that on YouTube, I guarantee it. You realize early on that, that you get to teach these children. You see, we're all called to teach. Maybe it's friends or other relatives and a family and a job, a church or a classroom. And we see the example of Christ in this passage. I think that'll be helpful to us as we look at three characteristics that Jesus showed and demonstrated as he taught on the mountain. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray you'd help us these next few moments. Lord, would you touch our hearts and challenge us? Would you help us to look to your son, Jesus, and realize that he is truly the one? Lord, may we learn and be touched this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to notice, first of all, and if you have your Bibles there, turn it back to Matthew chapter 5. The, the section of Scripture that is the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7, three chapters. And it begins in Matthew chapter 5, and that's where, where I think we, we should begin this morning, in verse number 1. And it says this, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... And from there he begins to teach all these different things. But I'd say this, first of all, that to, to be like Christ in this, Christ was, first of all, he was inclusive, he was not exclusive, he was inclusive. If we're going to have an impact on people, if we're going to have truly make a difference in people's lives, we have to learn to be inclusive, not exclusive. There are times that there are certain people, maybe even certain students, that we connect with more because of maybe personality or because of some background. And it seems like there are always those times that there is that one student that maybe doesn't quite mesh as well as the other students. I remember when my wife and I were expecting Johnny, and we had to choose that name for our son. My wife, as a teacher, had a whole list of names that weren't going to happen in our house. She said, I can't call him this because I'll think of this dude. I can't call him this. I'm like, honey, what can we call this child? And, uh, and maybe as a teacher, you've had the same experience. Like, oh boy, this name still makes me shudder. I look at Jesus, and, and teachers are wonderful in this. He was inclusive. He shows concern for all. If you look at those verses in a moment, you say, well, it looks like it's just the disciples at first. But remember, I, I showed you first in, in Matthew chapter 7, and the whole multitude heard him. Apparently in this thing, it was not just the disciples. It was for anyone who wanted to show up. That's the way Jesus was inclusive. He had a door wide open. He showed concern for all. It wasn't just his accelerated class of disciples. It was for everyone. It was a multitude. It was, it was showing he reached out to them. Not only did he show concern, but he showed compassion. He showed compassion. He took time to sit down and teach. I look at these three chapters, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. And if you were to count, it's quite a lengthy passage. Or quite a lengthy amount of time that, that he would have been speaking. And no doubt that his voice, I'm sure at times, became a little bit tired and his throat became a little bit parched. Perhaps at times he had to, he had to even maybe use the restroom and, 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 and yet he still gave of himself to teach other people. He was concerned and showed compassion. My wife had taken some time off teaching and this last year was her first year back after a little hiatus from teaching. And that first, couple, that first week or so, her voice, she'd come home a little bit scratchy as she taught all day long. But she never complained, as I don't hear teachers often complain, because she has compassion. The truth is, at times, we may be the only love that that student ever sees in that classroom. The only smiling face, the only kindness, the only interaction that's not negative in their life. And Jesus showed compassion. He's our example in that. In Mark, it says at one point that he was moved with compassion. You know, when you, when you show compassion, strange things happen. I was youth pastor here for a few years, and I remember one time on a mission trip, we're up in Canada, and, and we had a little bit of extra time, and so we, we let the, the teenagers go shop a little bit at the mall, just for a few minutes. At the time we came to get back on the bus, I remember that one of the, the teen, or two of the teen girls, came running up to me. 
And like, Pastor JD, Pastor JD, this is what I bought. And they showed me all these things that they bought in the mall. It was kind of like a, I don't know if you've ever had these kind of an out-of-body experience. You ever had that where you're kind of like you're there, but you're kind of like observing what's going on? Anybody ever had those or is it just me? Am I, am I the weirdest one in the room? Wait, don't answer that question, okay? I don't want to know the answer. But I remember clearly thinking, you know what? I don't really care what they bought. I, I'm glad you bought earrings or whatever kind of paraphernalia you bought. But I do care because I care about them. And you get that picture. What is it? Well, it's you and me. I'm glad you told me because I wouldn't have noticed that. You care because of compassion. And people and students and friends and family can tell when you care. I think one of the reasons that they followed Jesus is because they could tell that he cared. He had compassion. Not only was he inclusive, he was instructive. He was instructive. Boy, I love this part. He was practical. And throughout this passage, in these three chapters, he teaches some very specific things. He begins to, first of all, teach about people. He teaches early on on how to treat people. He says things like this, you know, if you have an enemy, you ought to love them. Love your enemies. I bet that caught, that took people and caught them off guard. Love my enemies? I'm not supposed to get them back. I'm not supposed to treat them like they treated me. He says, no, 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 no. Love your enemies. Do good to them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This was abnormal. He taught about people. He also taught about priorities. It's there in Matthew chapter 6 that we find this verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He said, look at, look at your current priorities and, and, and do right. And in this current day and age, we have a lot of things that, ought, that, 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 that other people say ought to be our priorities. They say, well, your health is your highest priority. Your health ought to be important, but it can't be my highest priority. And probably for many of us, it's not a highest priority. Oh, well, well, your kids ought to be your highest priority, and, and kids are definitely important. I love my kids so, so much, but, but they're not my highest priority. Jesus says that, seek ye first the kingdom of God. My highest priority is Jesus Christ, is God himself. He was very practical about that. He, he taught about priorities, and he taught about perception. He taught about perception. We have arguably, I'd say, in, in Matthew chapter 7, one of the most familiar verses that even people who have never darkened the doors of a church, they know this verse. It is a verse that, that you will hear from someone who's never come to church. And the verse goes, judge not that you be not judged. It's often misquoted, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. You see, you know that verse, where people quote that verse, you've never read the Bible one day in their life. Jesus taught about that in this section, on the mountain. He's on the mountain, and his point in that was, was not not to judge. His point was, be careful how you judge, because the standard that you hold to someone else is going to be held to you. Boy, that's a good lesson, isn't it? That, that how you treat And boy, I mean, if you're in a classroom around young children at all, you understand that, that they will have a high standard. But, but they're so honest. In the sense of they're real. Jesus was instructive. He was very practical. You know, people need to know how the Bible and how God affects their lives. It matters uh, what this book says. It matters how we live. It matters how we follow God. I want to make sure always that we're practical, that we take this Word of God and we apply it to our lives each and every day. It is such a practical book for us. It tells us things like, Be ye kind one to another. What a great verse. Be ye kind. It tells us on how to, on how to answer softly. But not only was Jesus inclusive and was he instructive, the last thing he was was this, he was inspirational. I read that verse we read at the beginning in Matthew chapter 7, 28 and 29. Everyone heard him and, and, and then they were astonished. That word astonished means they, they, they were caught off guard here in the scripture. It means that they, they were almost speechless. So wait, this is different. The world is filled with inspirational teachers. And I thank the Lord that we've had here and in this place and in this city. I read this story about one teacher that was, began in 1997. At the end of the school year, 
the sixth grade teacher wrote a message to her 12-year-old Christian's report card. The message went as follows, It's been a joy to have you in class. Keep up the good work at 12 and invite me to your Harvard graduation. It was 1997. In 2018, that young 12-year-old crossed the stage to collect her doctorate from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And guess who was there but her sixth grade teacher? Her 12, inspirational. You see, you think it's just a random comment? You think it's just a, a side note? But that could be, those could be the words, that could be the thought that inspires them to do great. We see in Matthew chapter 7 that, that we read already that Jesus inspired those people. It was unbelievable, first of all. He, they were astonished. He was also unmatched. See, Jesus was the greatest teacher, I, would, I believe, that ever lived. He was unmatched. And here, in their minds, they have this man who was not like a scribe. He seemed like a common person, but yet he spoke, the Bible says, with authority. He spoke with authority. He spoke the very words of God. Before he is God, he inspired those to follow him. He says in John chapter 14, verse 6, For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one can come to the Father except by me. He was inspiring. There were a group of fishermen that he called. He said, follow me. And they left their nets and they, they followed him. Oh, everywhere he went, there were, there were crowds that, that flocked to him. He was inspirational. And he challenged them with this thought about the kingdom of heaven. He said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to, to minister and what he's saying is, I came not to be served. I'm not looking for you to meet my needs. I'm looking to meet your needs. And the greatest need that we have, that anyone ever has, is the need of salvation. You see, we're born sinners, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God commended, he showed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he began his earthly ministry at about the age of 30. For three years, he taught and ministered to people and, and, and healed. And then at, at, at 30 years old, or 33, they crucified him on the cross. He died for the sins of mankind. You see, he had lived a perfect life as the Son of God. He'd never sinned a single time. As he died on the cross, he uttered these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then these words, it is finished. It is finished. That's why the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then if someone were to trust Christ, and when they trust Christ as their Savior, and they believe only in Him and ask Him to save them from their sins, that He will take them to live with Him forever in heaven. There was a thief on the cross that day. Actually, there are two thieves, and one began to berate Christ, berate the Lord, and said, if you really be the Christ, then, then get us down from here. And the other one said, no, don't do that. He said, remember me. You go to paradise. Remember me. And Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me. He offered that thief on the cross forgiveness. As he offers all of us, he's inspirational. I can look around this church, and I see people whose lives have been touched by Jesus Christ. Marriage is put back together, homes reestablished, men and women who maybe struggled with something and now are free from, from these things, and, and, and people who, who were maybe deadbeats according to society before but now have a prosperous life. Why? Because Jesus is inspirational. His power is unmatched, and he has authority. You see, we can, we can touch lives but I want to touch him with the power of Christ. The dinner guests were sitting around the table discussing life. One man, a CEO, decided to explain the problem with education. He argued, what's a kid going to learn from someone who decided his best option in life was to become a teacher? He reminded the other dinner guests what they say about teachers. Those who can do, those who can't teach. To stress his point, he said to another guest, y you're a teacher, Susan. Now be honest, what do you make? Susan, who had a reputation for honesty and frankness, replied, you want to know what I make? 
I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I make a C-plus feel like the winner of the Congressional Medal, Medal of Honor. I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute silence. You want to know what I make? I make kids wonder. I make them question. I make them apologize and mean it. I, I make them write. I make them read, read, read. I make them show all their work in math and perfect their final drafts in English. I make them understand that if you have the brains and follow your heart, and if someone ever tries to judge you by what you make, just may pay no attention because they just didn't learn. Susan paused and then continued, You want to know what I make? I make a difference. What do you make, sir? And with the power of Christ, he wants to make a difference this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you. With your son Jesus, he gives us such an example of a teacher. Lord, I thank you for the teachers here this morning and all the guests here. Lord, I pray you'd guide us during this time. I wonder if there's someone here this morning who said, Pastor Howell, as you spoke, the Lord touched my heart. I want to be that right kind of teacher. I'm not saying you're a teacher. Like I pointed out, we all have an obligation to teach. You say, but I want God's power. Would you pray for me this morning? The Lord touched my heart this morning. Would you pray for me? Amen. Amen. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Amen. Amen. Lord, touch my heart this morning. Amen. Amen. I wonder if there's someone here this morning who doesn't know that they're on their way to heaven. We'd love to pray for you. Say, Pastor Todd, when you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip your hand up and slip your hand down. I won't draw any more attention to you now than I did to anyone else then. Say, would you pray for me? Oh, Lord, I pray you'd guide this time. Lord, help those who raise their hand and, Lord, you touch their hearts. Would you help us this morning in Jesus' name? Amen. As we stand to our feet and the piano begins to play, the altar is open. We love to show the Bible, open the Bible, and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Of course, I'm going to pray with you. We have men and women up front who can pray with you.